and welcome back to Consumer Choice Radio, broadcasting here on The Big Talker, 106.7 FM and Saga, 960 AM in the Peel region, Ontario, Canada. Uh, we had a great guest uh, in our uh, second segment there, but we're just topping off the Sunday here with Rick Henderson. He's an award-winning North Carolina-based writer and journalist, a former editor at the Carolina Journal, and he's the brains behind the politics-focused deregulator.net Substack website. Rick, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much, Gail. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, you're someone who is uh, very familiar with uh, the comings and goings of what's happening in the Old North State, but I know that you've begun writing more on national issues. And I wanted to get to that because I wanted to help promote your Substack a bit. Um, before we get into sort of the policy wonkish stuff, because I, I know we want to keep our audience and not uh, get too much in the weeds, uh, but you know, you're know, you someone who's had a, a very mainstream journalism career, sort of in the think tank space, journalism space, and now you have your own sub stack. What has that transition been like? Kind of what pushed you in that direction and, and how do you see it going forward? What's interesting about this is that I was uh, a blogger very, very early in the days. I started about 2002 when I was working at the uh, Review Journal in Las Vegas, Nevada, and enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, at the time, it was really difficult to monetize anything like that. And uh, fortunately for me, I was given a lot of freedom to uh, write whatever I wanted to on the blog. And there were, there were no in-house blogs at that time at the newspaper. So they were very encouraging about uh, sort of promoting the platform, uh, promoting the newspaper, promoting my work and the like, and also to write outside of what you write if you're an editorial writer or a columnist on the Metro Daily, you're supposed to stay as focused as possible on local issues. Uh, I had been at Reason Magazine and Investors Business Daily. Uh, so I'd, had a, I'd written for a national audience for more than a decade before that. And so I got, I got to keep my uh, national issues chops going with the blog. But uh, since then, went back, of course, to other newspapers, was at, was at Carolina Journal for almost 12 years. And uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, I just was thinking, I, I am of the age that I thought I had at least one more chapter left to write. And I'd spent uh, the past uh, dozen years essentially shoveling copy, not doing a lot of writing, uh, do, not doing much expression of my own, that I wanted to give it another chance if it was possible. And Substack made that possible. It's, that's, that's something that technology that was not available uh, in 2002 or even 2015 that made it possible for uh, a writer who had a specific uh, voice that he or she wanted to, to express could uh, find an audience or connect with an existing audience, reconnect with an existing audience, and then also monetize it, which was just, uh, it was wonderful. And the thing that's nice about Substack, uh, there, and there are other platforms that will do this, but the thing that was particularly nice for me about Substack was that unlike the old days of Blogger and even WordPress, you had a platform that really, really worked. I mean, you don't, you don't have to worry that much about having to code. With uh, I still have my old blogger side alive, and you still have to do HTML with a lot of stuff there. And so, I mean, it just, you know, it, it's, it, you learn to do it, but it's just much more convenient to plug and play. And, and beyond, beyond some of the uh, subscriber model uh, aspects as to why Substack might be coming more popular, do you think that there is a bit of a divergence maybe in newsrooms or editorial discussions that's also driving other folks to Substack? Because we've seen some very prominent writers um, at some national outlets make the move, and some of them have been citing editorial disagreements, essentially, as the reason why they wanted to have maybe a little more independence. Is that something that you find in, in your own journey um, to Substack? Oh, uh, I mean, absolutely. I uh, before we uh, before we started uh, the, the segment, I was I was telling Al that I got I, I spent some time writing making a list of people who had migrated to Substack from other publications, and I couldn't make an exhaustive enough list of the people that of the prominent people that I follow, just because I read a lot of journalism. But people like Andrew Sullivan and Matt Taibbi and uh, Glenn Greenwald and Matt Iglesias. Uh, and then he goes on to even Mickey Kaus, one of the original great bloggers. Uh, anyway, all these folks have done that. Some are doing it, most of them are doing it for monetary gain, but you have people like Megan McArdle, for instance, who just does a 
weekly newsletter uh, that, that she gives away. And it's just sort of stuff. Here's what I read this week that was interesting that I couldn't write about in my Washington Post column. So it, it provides that opportunity. For me, it was good because um, I've been covering largely North Carolina politics with a few national uh, implications of, of things that are happening at the state level for a dozen years. And after a while, uh, because we don't have term limits in North Carolina, except for some ex executive branch officials, you have the same players quite often. And so uh, it, I was looking forward to the opportunity to be able to branch out and write about how some of these issues locally uh, play out on the national front, and then also how some national issues uh, you know, might have spurred up in, in state houses and the like. I mean, I'm a big I'm a big uh, supporter of, of federalism and the and the and the benefits that that provides, and the fact that you have uh, more and more freedom for localities, uh, ostensibly in the U.S. than you have in a lot of places. And so, I'm very interested in how federalism is going to survive administrations in Washington that try to take more and more power away from uh, individuals and, and localities. And so, that that's something that I could explore. In a, in a separate writing space that I might not get the opportunity to if I'm working on something that's sort of a state focused uh, and, and limited to this one area. We're speaking with Rick Henderson here on Consumer Choice Radio. You can follow him on Twitter at Deregulator, great name, and also deregulator.net, the website we're talking about. All right, so let's get into this, Rick, a little bit. I saw that uh, you actually co-wrote an article in the News and Observer uh, up there in Raleigh. And it has to do with HR1. Uh, this seems to be something that's a, a big target uh, for, for many people around the country. A lot of people are praising it. A lot of people are casting it as the next great election reform. Uh, tell us what it's all about and why you think it might be problematic. Well, it's it was the fact that it got the number HR1, that it was the first bill introduced in the House, and there's S1, the same uh, legislation in the Senate, uh, it's, it's been kicking around now for several years, but it's essentially a law that would attempt to centralize almost all election management in Washington, D.C., through the federal government. Congress would be writing most of, this, of the election laws that govern state and local elections. Now, Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution, Section 8, says that most of this is supposed to be handled by state legislatures. There are certain exemptions, of course, uh, having to do with uh, individual rights. If a state is trying to disenfranchise Black people, for instance, you can't do that. The, the Voting Rights Act covers that. Uh, but essentially, the management and operation of elections is supposed to be handled at the state level. And that's why you have states that have all mail ballot elections. You have states that have almost no early voting. You have states that have uh, no excuse absentee balloting. In other words, you, if you just want to vote absentee, you can. You have others where you have to actually provide a reason why you're not going to appear at, a, at an early voting site or at, or at a polling place on election day. So there's this, this, this uh, total uh, you know, quilt of, uh, of mosaic of laws that exist around the country. And it's a very good thing because we find out that uh, if you have everything managed from one place and it's a one size fits all, situation and something goes wrong, then it's catastrophic at a national level. At a state level, it could be very problematic or troublesome. HR1 just simply tries to sweep away all those objections and uh, would set up everything from how redistricting would be handled to the length of early voting. It would mandate early voting in all jurisdictions, even places that don't have it right now. And then there are campaign finance portions of the bill that would require donor disclosure. Uh, there's an area that uh, the Supreme Court has ruled that uh, some donor anonymity is something that can be, uh, that, that should be protected, uh, especially if you are not directly contributing to a political candidate, but if you're contributing to a cause, such as the Center for Consumer Choice. If you're contributing to a, a 501c3 or a c4, and you're trying to uh, promote some ideas, you should be allowed to be to do so anonymously if you choose, and that would actually sweep some of those protections aside as well. So it's a real mess. Uh, uh, my Bob Hall, who is the progressive retired uh, former head of the Democracy NC group, and I wrote this op-ed, and we just wanted to say these decisions should be left to state legislatures. Now he and I differ on the bill itself. He would like to actually have Congress 
do some of these sorts of things. But he thought the bill was just too big and did too much. And so we came together as sort of a, someone from the libertarian side and someone from the progressive side saying, uh, look, this is something that uh, that Congress shouldn't uh, should keep its hands off of. And it's it's funny we hear you bring up the the donor privacy aspect of this. Um, and I have I have had this conversation with many uh, progressive colleagues or friends using Planned Parenthood as an example or some other um, reproductive rights charity. I don't, I get really uncomfortable at the thought of let's say someone donating to those uh, institutions or those causes because they feel it's best for them, then all of a sudden by law being doxxed and having their information or their name made public uh, and then making themselves available to harassment or all sorts of other problems from people who very passionately disagree. And, and that, that's a, a very pressing kind of progressive example where supporting a progressive cause could um, could draw you the fire of those who disagree with you by way of this law, essentially exposing your name and or information as a result. And of course, there are um, uh, other examples on, on the flip side of that. Um, I do have a quick follow up just in terms of where you think some of the voting legislation has gone right, if you've written about that before, because Yael and I have, have gone back and forth on advanced voting, mail-in voting, all of the other options, jurisdiction that does a particularly good job in terms of streamlining all of this that maybe other states or jurisdictions could look to to avoid these headaches. And was allegedly, uh, and what that resulted in was essentially an election being overturned and rehelped in a congressional district. And so, but the people involved are now in the criminal justice system, if you will. They have not all, uh, that those haven't all been resolved. But uh, North Carolina has done that sort of thing well. Uh, we have very open voting laws in many ways. We do, we do have no abs, uh, excuse absentee balloting. So you have a long period in which you can request an absentee ballot. There's, a, there's an online tracking system for those mail ballots. That, uh, that, that you can actually request an absentee ballot and then still show up at the polls on election day so long as you haven't turned that ballot in. Every, and everything is, is fairly transparent. I think we do the job pretty well. There are a lot of states that are not comfortable with that. I'll, I'll add one thing too, is that our state is one of the few, I think we're the earliest in the nation that actually allows local officials to uh, start processing those mail ballots 30 days before the election. So they can actually go through you will have uh, election uh, referees, judges, whatever, look at these ballots, make sure that they were mailed properly, make sure that everything's there. They don't actually count them, but they process them, they put them aside, and they run them through the machines on election day. But that avoids the problem of having massive numbers of, uh, of votes that have to be processed on election day and confusion and, and days and days and days of delays. And final question here, Rick, before we go to, to break, and uh, it's been great having you on. Uh, one thing you've written a lot about is uh, sort of the national GOP and where things are going. I know you've been a, a keen observer of uh, former President Donald J. Trump, not necessarily his biggest fan. But what do you think is, is kind of the future of, of the GOP? I know we see this uh, kind of Josh Hawley wing that's trying to be a kind of replacer. I guess Ted Cruz is dining down with Trump and Mar-a-Lago. Uh, where do you think the, the GOP goes? Do you think it'll be a free market party once more, or are we still mired in the ire of Trump? Uh, we're still stuck with Donald Trump, I'm afraid, for a while, which is something that, that uh, puzzles me because... Uh, he's someone that under his watch, I mean, the Republicans lost the House, they lost the Senate, and lost the Senate largely thanks to him, uh, not inter or intervening in the wrong way in the two Georgia runoff elections that took place in January. And then the presidency, he lost the presidency as well. And yet, for whatever reason, uh, well, I, I could cite reasons. I think for one thing, Republican elected officials are scared of their voters. They are afraid to actually tell voter, their voters the truth. And so I think there's a reckoning period ahead for the Republicans. Now, the Democrats have similar reckoning issues because you do have a very progressive wing that's, uh, that's, that's extremely loud and a more, uh, a more center left uh, wing, largely dominated by, uh, by African-Americans who are now the most 
conservative Democrats, which is sort of hard to believe for anyone who's studied U.S. politics. But I think the Republicans' reckoning is coming sooner. And uh, I don't know what that means, actually. I really don't know. There, there may be a time in which the GOP is in the wilderness. You have an awful lot more people disaffiliating from the Republican Party, and they may, uh, you may, they may have a hard time winning elections uh, outside of, say, state legislatures and places like that where they, can, where they have to stick to their knitting because they have to do things like pass balanced budgets. And they have to do things that, uh, that a national party doesn't. That's wonderful. And you can uh, check out more on deregulator.net. Rick Henderson's Substack site. Rick, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks for having me very much. I really appreciate it.